in a week's time, I can do a lot of thinking. A lot of things just twirling around in my mind. Things that are, things that have been, been, things that could be. Think about the life and the ministry of the church, where we are right now, and all this crazy pandemic stuff. Will there come a day in time, anywhere in the near future, that we can get back to some kind of normalcy? You know, I don't know. You know, we've already dealt with Delta. We've dealt with Omicron. And I don't know what the next Greek word they're coming up with. But I'm hoping that there's not another one. I'm hoping and we can just get beyond this. Because what I see more than anything else is uh, how the devil is really taking this and running. You know, we're not, uh, we're not committed like we once were. But then there's others that are committed and you still remain committed to the cause. When I look at this church, a church our size, I realize we really are blessed. And I want to thank God, and I do thank God, for all the many people that do so many things in our church. You know, there's the obvious ones that you see standing in front or sitting in front. But then there's so many other people that do so many things behind the scenes. Things that you really don't give a lot of thought to because you probably don't need to give thought to it. But for those that are sitting at home right now watching live stream, that doesn't just happen. There's people behind the scenes that have been working hard and will continue to work hard after all of this to get things edited out and all of that. I think about the people that continue to work with our children and our young people and their faithfulness and commitment even during these trying times. You let somebody in our church lose a loved one and go through that time of bereavement, and this church is par excellent when it comes to reaching out and ministering to, to those people, those individuals, sending cards, sending text messages, giving words uh, of encouragement. You let somebody have a doctor's appointment scheduled for, say, Wednesday, but yet something comes up where they can't uh, uh, make that appointment because the car's in the shop. You'll be one of the first ones that'll go to bat and say, hey, I can take you. I'll, I'll be your transportation. And a lot of times you even go the extra mile. Let's just go out and eat somewhere. So I see so many things like that. I, I shared in the 9 o'clock service this morning. This has happened a time or two. Um, you let somebody out in the parking lot, say, after the Sunday services or the evening services, and they have car trouble. You don't just leave them out there in the parking lot and say, well, good luck. I wish I could help you. I'm not a mechanic, Marshall. I, I can't help. What are you doing? Listen, let, let, we'll get this car started. I've got some jumper cables. Have they got a flat tire? Well, let me help you with that. I've seen it happen. Now, interestingly enough, most of the vehicles that we have trouble with here that won't start are usually Dodges, okay? Now, I don't have any explanation for that, okay? But Ford and Chevrolet seem to hang on pretty good, okay? But the list goes on and on. The things that, that you all do to put on that Christ-like attitude to be an example of Christ. Not just in word, but in deed. So that's what we call a servant. And you as servants have to go the extra mile. You do that. You want to do that. I commend you for doing that. That is a good example of what Jesus was talking about when he talked about us being his disciple. And that's what we are. Call us what you want to call us. But if we are indeed a follower, then we are his disciple. And we're doing his work. He's not here in flesh and bone, but his presence is here. We are the one in flesh and bone that's carrying out his work. Now, true discipleship is going to be the theme of the message this morning. And I underscore the word true. I told David when he put it up on the screen, make sure you capitalize all letters of true, T-R-U-E, not just a disciple. A true, genuine, authentic disciple. That's what I want you to be. I want you to want to be that. 
And when we really understand the true identity and the true definition of a true disciple, then I don't know that we could even begin to imagine how the Lord can bless us in great and mighty ways. In our scripture today, we will see the naming of the 12 disciples. We'll also see where Jesus refers to them as apostles. Interestingly enough, the word disciple means learner. What are you here today? Why are you in Sunday school? Why do you come to Bible study on Wednesday nights? Because you want to learn. And a true disciple wants to learn. I've been in the ministry almost 50 years, and I'll be the first to tell you, there's a lot I still have to learn. I don't know it all. I'm still in the process of learning and grabbing a hold of that and soaking it in. And it's not just up here. If it stays up here, then it doesn't do too much. It's got to move from here to here. What I learn can stay up here. What we learn can stay up here. We can have that knowledge. But there's 14 inches on the average from the head to the heart. And we've got to get from that head knowledge to the heart knowledge. And when we have that heart knowledge of being a true disciple, it's going to be in our blood to just help people to reach out and be a servant. Now, hopefully, everyone that's here today and everyone within the sound of my voice out there through the social media will be able to identify themselves as a disciple because they are a learner learning all the things that they can learn about the Word of God, His actions, His Word, what we need to do and how we need to emulate that. And we do that through the leadership and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Okay, we're going to look first at Luke, the 6th chapter, verse 12. In these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. And all night... He continued in prayer to God. Now, this is early in Jesus' ministry. We probably could guess that he had 75, 100, maybe 125, 150 other followers. Or we'll see a little bit more about that in our scripture. People that wanted to spend time with Jesus. They knew that he was a teacher. They wanted to learn from him. And it was important that they found themselves amongst him in that crowd. They wanted to spend time on a regular basis with him. But Jesus knew that he needed a smaller group, a more intimate group, people that he could get to know in a more personal way and they could get to know him in a more personal way, day in and day out. He needed them in full-time training and service. Full-time training. So in preparation for this selection of the 12 special disciples, Jesus spent time in prayer. He didn't just handpick 12 people. He prayed about this. He wanted to make sure those were the right ones. He prayed all night long. It was the last time he prayed all night long. What did you pray for all night long? I don't know that any of us prayed all night long. But if we did pray all night long, what would it be for? And I can remember several years ago having an all-night prayer meeting for somebody that was sick, a child, and, and praying all night. People were there praying all night long. The guy was, uh, the baby was, a, uh, not sure if I'm going to get this right. Uh, uh, it was a waterhead, a hydro something there. And uh, the doctor said, he's not going to live. But they prayed all night long, and he did. And, and lived for 30, 40 years, 50 years. So uh, all because somebody was praying all night. But I'm afraid that if we tried praying all night, chances are we would not be much better than Peter, James, and John, because we see, too, that they were dozing. They were asleep at the wheel, so to speak. And then when we look at verses 13 through 16, and when day came, remember this was night, when, when daylight came, he called his disciples, and he chose them from 12. 
whom he named apostles. They were disciples, but he's named them specifically apostles. Simon, whom he called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and then there's the other Judas, Judas Iscariot. He became a traitor. Jesus chose these 12 to be with him constantly. And you know, I like being around people. I really do. But can I be a little honest with you? I don't know that I want 12 people around me every day, all day long. But these people were, and for three years, you know what they think, you know how they smell, you know everything about them. Every awakening moment was together. So obviously, they got to know him inside and out, and he got to know them. Now, we call them disciples, and we know that we are to be a disciple. But we see in one of those verses there that he actually designated them as being apostles. Now, the word apostle actually comes from a Greek word, apostolos, which means someone who is sent out. And they were sent out to follow him and to serve him. But when I look at these disciples here, I look at how ordinary these people were. There was nothing extraordinary about them. And they weren't highly educated people. They weren't famous. They weren't influential in the community. And they probably wouldn't win any popularity contest there in Galilee. Only one of them, Matthew, had any money to speak of. And more than likely, he got that dishonestly before he got that calling. And then I think about the diversity of these disciples, apostles. All of them are from Galilee, except for Judas Iscariot. Now here's this band, this band of apostles. And among them, they're fishermen. There's this fanatic nationalist that we'll call Simon the Zealot. Uh, if there's any political party, he would have been the leader of that political party there. Now, Simon Zealot, remember, is not Simon Peter, okay? And then there's the man that we know as the tax collector, Matthew. What I notice about this, when Jesus calls the 12, what does he do with them? Does he send them down to a three-day retreat and go through some training with them? No. He immediately puts them to work. They're called. Look, look at the cycle here. He spent all night praying. Praying to his heavenly father to make the right selection, the right people. He comes down from the mountain there. He makes that selection. And then he immediately sends him to work. He, he puts him to work. And then when we look at verses 17, 18, and 19. And he, meaning Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, coming down from the mountain, standing on a level place with a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him. So these were followers that he had. These were wannabe disciples. Even if they weren't disciples, there was something about them longing to be a disciple because they wanted to be healed. They wanted to be healed of their diseases, their afflictions, their affirmities, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him. Just try to get that picture. Try to get that image there. Now here's Jesus. He's come down. He's on plain ground from the mountain here. And everybody is seeking after. They want to follow him. I wonder what some of the others must have thought when maybe, maybe, maybe he'll choose me as being one of his apostles. Were there any jealousy going on there? Why did they choose Matthew over me? I'm a lot better person than Matthew. But what about Simon the Zealot? Well, I don't know all that, okay? But God chose who he chose. 
and they sought after him. Even those that weren't a part of the 12, they knew he had that power. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to be healed. They knew that he was that Messiah. Now, apparently, Jesus believed in on-the-job training. That's what he did. Put him right to work. On-the-job training. He simply led the 12 apostles down the mountain to where all the human hurts were, all the needs, all the people that were longing. And again, he doesn't go through any training session with them, no retreat somewhere. He immediately puts them to work. Now, obviously, he instructs them. If you know anything about his teachings at all, you know that. Now, you and I may not identify ourselves as apostles, but I do hope that we can identify ourselves as committed disciples. And only you can determine how committed you are. Only you know whether or not you are committed. Now, that commitment will go far beyond the 11 to 12 o'clock hour or the 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock hour or the evening hour. It goes far beyond that. It's what we do out there. We cannot be a disciple if all that we do is right here in church. That's not what a disciple does. We are to be sent out. So if we are to be a true disciple, exactly what does that mean? What are the implications of truly being a disciple? The person that God himself wants us to be. Well, let me make a, a few quick, simple suggestions. First of all, there's someone out there praying for you. Did you know that? There's someone out there praying for you. And his name, his name is Jesus Christ. Now, we don't talk a lot about that. But Jesus Christ approaches the throne of his heavenly Father on our behalf. This living Christ somehow manages to pray over all the millions of people out there that are his disciples. Now, we are limited to time. We're limited to space. But he is not. Now, how do we know that he prays for us? Well, the Bible tells us that. And it's more than one place, but let me mention the first epistle of John, not the gospel of John, the first epistle of John. Second chapter starts out by saying, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's our advocate. And I'm trying to think of what is a good analogy or what is a good synonym in this case for an advocate. I would call that advocate our defense attorney. You ever been in the courtroom? Over the years, I've been in the courtroom many times. I've seen several Several lawyers really do their thing over the years. I've seen defense attorneys that would go to the defense of their clients. And they would go to the defense before the judge and maybe the jury. But he is speaking on their behalf. That's the picture that I get when Jesus is approaching the throne of his heavenly father for us. Jesus is that agent of the law. And there is that client-attorney relationship. So when all the things that are going on in our lives, all the hurts, all the pains, all the difficulties, we need to know and be reminded that Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. He is going on our behalf. He is working on our behalf. God responds. He responds to our tears. He responds to our anxieties. All the confusion in life. And in a week's time, we can deal with a lot of people going through a lot of things. We need a defense attorney. We need somebody that's got our back and somebody that's going to bat for us. And nobody can do that better than Christ himself. Instantly. We see the living Christ is before his heavenly Father, pleading, pleading our cases. Maybe it's our sins, our own iniquities, the things that we need to be dealing with. Maybe it's our hurts, our problems, our situations. But we have an advocate, and Jesus Christ is our advocate. Now, the second distinctive thing that I see about 
being a disciple is that we're in good company. We are in good company. We're not by ourselves. We're in good company. Think about that first group of 12. And you've seen them named. What about that first group of 12? What did it include? Well, there's that charismatic leader, Simon Peter. And if you don't want to think about Simon, I'd say, yeah, he had a charisma about him. That caused people just to look at him and take notice of him. Now he was that disciple that uh, had that foot and mouth disease. He was always opening his mouth and sticking his foot in it. Um, but God used him in a great and powerful way, and I would call him a charismatic leader. And then there's that innocently charming and approachable Philip. Now, if any one of those disciples that I'd just really love to sit down and go to Cracker Barrel with one day, it'd be Philip. Philip, tell me what it was like to be one of your be one of Christ's disciples. Tell me what it was like with your winsome, approachable spirit. What did the Lord teach you? What's the Lord teaching us? And then there's Andrew. I would call Andrew that evangelist because Scripture tells us that he led his brother John to the Lord and became a soul winner. We need more people like Andrew in our churches. We need people, uh, more people like Andrew in our communities here. They have a burden for lost souls. And then there's Thomas. We know anything about Thomas. We know that he's the doubter. Always questioning. You know, see where he's made reference to in, in, in the Gospels. And we see that he wasn't even sure of Jesus' nail-scarred hands. He had to be proven to him. But he was a seeker. And there's something about being a seeker that you have to appreciate. I think this is a pretty delightful group of disciples overall. Now you've got Judas Iscariot and some things going on there. But to be with a band of 12 people every day, all day long, for three years, I think he had a pretty good group of people there. I thought about this when I think about being in great company with other people that, that know the Lord. And uh, I did not ask for your permission, Pat, but I did share this in the 9 o'clock service this morning. I think about your mother. I think about all the prayers that she has lifted up on behalf of other people, myself being one of them, my family being one of them, our church being one of them. I think about last Tuesday night. What was it, 5, 24, something like that? When we celebrated her home going. It was a sad time, but it was a happy time too. We weren't laughing, but it was a happy time. You know, I think about the writer of Hebrews when he talks about, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, she is now, Sel is now in that great cloud of witnesses. And, and the, the writer of Proverbs is telling us to throw off everything that hinders us and all the sin that so easily entangles us. Folks, we just need to step back a moment. And we've got to realize there are a lot of things out there that we can hinder us from being the disciple that the Lord wants us to be. There's a lot of things out there that can entangle us our sin can entangle us. We can't be effective. We can't be what God wants us to be. But there's that great cloud of witnesses. And then he says, let us run with perseverance. And I'd underscore the word perseverance. Hanging in there. Being tough. Run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. So see, as we find ourselves as a disciple in God's house, as a community of faith, and even those that have gone on are in that great cloud of witnesses, we're in good company. And I don't know any better company that we could find ourselves with. And then we are called to be Christ extension. We are an extension to his work, his life, his ministry. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, now, look at yourself right now for a moment, okay? Just turn off and tune out everything else. Just, just look at yourself for a moment. Where are you? Where are you in your walk and your relationship with, with the Lord? I, I ask this a lot, probably more than some of you feel comfortable in me saying. But if you're just here to investigate other people, if you are just here to go through the motions, and then you probably don't want to hear anything else I have to say. Just disregard anything. But if you really are here today, and you're not just listening, but you're soaking it in, you're absorbing it, you truly are a seeker of God. And having that relationship, then you know you've got to have a personal relationship with God. You know, I know of a lot of people. But I don't really get to know them until I meet them, until I spend time with them, until I have an association with them. I know a lot of people. People ask, well, do you know? Well, I know of them. I've not met them. You know, I've not met Joe Burris. I think I like what I see and what I hear from him, but I've not met him. I don't have a personal relationship with him. But once you have a personal relationship with the Lord, it's not just a surface thing. It's something that goes very deep. And I'm hoping, I'm praying, that we are seekers and having that personal relationship. And, and you really can't have that personal relationship with the Lord until you've come to the point where you confess all, confess all the wrong, all the sin, uh, all the sin, all the iniquities that may happen. Even as good as we are, we're going to fall short. And we just simply got to trust Jesus Christ for the sacrifice that he made on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can experience salvation and know that our souls are saved in eternity. See, I believe that if we are truly one of these disciples, we are going to be grateful for what the Lord has done for us. And we want to invite him to be the leader of our lives. That's one of my prayers. Lord, I don't do too good leading myself. I need you. I need the Holy Spirit to be at work in my life. I need you to be leading me. Okay, I've got a question for you here. I'm beginning to wind down. What's your ministry? What's your ministry? See, there's that mindset that says, well, only the preacher uh, or the Sunday school teachers or the song leaders, those are the ministers. It goes far beyond that, folks. Every one of you here right now, if you have a relationship with the Lord, then you've got a ministry. What is your ministry? Ministry with the people that you're speaking to out there on a daily basis. And I believe, I have this happen, I have, I have, I have this happen all the time. All the time. Lord, put me where you, need to, where you need me to be. Just put me where you can use me. And I pray that prayer, invariably God's going to answer it. But I need to be equipped. I want to be ready for that. Every one of you all have your own ministry. It's not just me, folks. Every one of you have a ministry of being a disciple. Of the one you, you claim to know, the one who you claim to serve. Well, let me put it a different way. What are you doing for others that you would not be doing if you did not have that relationship with the Lord? What are you doing now for others that you never did before you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? That's a question we all need to ask. And I think we need to seek the answers. Now, you don't want to hear this, but there are no bench warmers for the kingdom of God. We've got to be out there on the field. And we've all got an active responsibility and duty to get off the bench and to do what God would have us to do. Now the words you've been looking for. In closing. In her book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World, Rebecca Rippert shares this true story. The young man's name was Bill. He was a college student. He had wild hair and a lot of tattoos. He wore nothing but jeans 
faded t-shirts and flip-flops. Now he was a brilliant, very intellectual college student, but he was very skeptical about Christianity. Hadn't been in church for years. But for some reason, he decided that he was going to go to church on this particular Sunday. So he went to a church not very far from the campus that he was a student on. He walked into the sanctuary that morning, tried to get this visual image as I describe this. It was about 11.30 on a Sunday morning. Now chances are, church started somewhere around 11 o'clock. This is 11.30. He's walking into this church, and he sees all of these people. They're dressed. They're dressed real nice. In fact, it's a rather formal group of people. But here he is in his usual attire. Hair sticking out. Wish I had some to stick out. Faded shirt and flip-flops. And he's walking down this aisle, and the church is packed. And he's looking at the people, trying to find a place to sit. And he couldn't find a place. People are looking at him, and you could sense that they were a little uncomfortable because somebody that didn't quite fit their mold was now in church with them. They were standing. They were singing one of the faithful hymns. Well, Bill is walking down the aisle and finally gets to the front and he realized there's no seat. So he really didn't know what to do. So he sat down in the aisle, folded his legs, and put his arms around his knees. Now try to get the image in the picture here. The hymn had concluded... The people were now seated, and there was tension in that sanctuary. The tension was rather thick, and the people were getting a little uptight. It was time for the minister to preach. So he gets up there to the pulpit, and just as he gets ready to speak, he notices an older gentleman from the back. And I'm picturing this as being a much larger sanctuary than ours, maybe like Edgewood or something, where there's a long aisle. And he sees this elderly gentleman walking down that aisle. He's a very dignified, very eloquently dressed individual. He's walking with a cane. Now everybody in that sanctuary that's looking at him and seeing what's going on, bound to be thinking, well, I know what that guy's going to do. He's going to go tell that college kid to get out of here if he can't be dressed any better than he is and go home. And that walk from the back of the church to that front pew seemed like eternity. Everything was quiet. All but the clicking of that elderly gentleman's came. All eyes were on him or that college student. And finally the elderly gentleman deacon gets right there beside him. What do you think he does? In a feeble way he sits right down beside him in the middle of that aisle. Shook his hand Patted him on the back. Said, Welcome to our church. Welcome to worship. Now, as you might guess, that was a rather emotional time for that church. But the minister, when he finally was able to speak, got up before his congregation and said, What I'm about to preach on today, you will soon forget. But what you have just witnessed, you will never forget forget. Now folks, that's what being a disciple is. Reaching out and ministering, doing what Jesus would do. And I'm constantly 
having to ask myself, what would Jesus do in a situation like this? How would he handle this? I'm constantly asking and praying for that. Would I be like that deacon walking down that aisle, shake his hand and say, hey, it's great to have you in God's house. See, I don't know the rest of that story. What did happen? I'd love to know. What did happen? Did he come back? Did he feel accepted? Did he see um, the, the love of Jesus Christ radiated through that deacon and perhaps others in the church? Or was he the only one that really accepted him when everybody brushed him off? I don't know. But I know what we should be doing. And we need to be reaching those people. And if we are a true disciple, we will. Let's pray.